But once again, a welcome to all of you who are guests, especially if you're out of town, maybe you're visiting family, came in to see someone that you love get baptized or just wandered in off the street. Whatever the case, we're glad you're here and to those joining us online as well to celebrate the risen king. You have your traditions at Easter, I'm sure, like mine. And one of the traditions we may share is our Easter egg hunts. Anybody do the Easter egg hunts? Yep. When I was a little kid, we would always go to my Uncle Bill's house for Easter. And I have all girl cousins on that side, and we would go Easter egg hunting. Uh, you know, just basically, they just throw them out in the yard behind the bushes and stuff. And they lined us all up and gave us baskets. I was like eight years old, maybe, and said, ready, go. And being the only boy and slightly competitive in those, those days, I got all the eggs. <laughs> and I mean, I got them all. I was grass-stained and sweaty. I had eggs in my pockets, eggs in my basket. My cousins were all crying. My sisters were crying, and I had all the eggs. But I figured it's a hunt, right? Survival of the fittest. You don't hunt, you don't live. I, I got the eggs, what do you want? Anyway, my mom, my Aunt Nancy, sat us all down, took my basket, and divvied up all the eggs evenly between us all. I'm still not over the injustice of that. I think that's when I realized I'm probably not a communist. I'm maybe I'm, anyway, that's no, kidding. Anyway, but I thought, like, what's, how can you just do that? You know, I got the eggs, but you've got your traditions as well. And our traditions are fun. You're going to go do that later today. It's a good thing. But sometimes the traditions that we celebrate, the things, that, the familiar stuff you do, church can just be part of that, right? We come, yada, 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 Jesus rose from the dead, let's go have brunch. We just go through the motions as part of the thing you do. And I recognize that I'm not, I, I'm not capable in the next 25 minutes or so to convey to you the sheer power of what it is we celebrate. I don't know that I could possibly convince you with my words of the incredible history-changing and life-changing power of the resurrection. I don't think I could convince you how desperately you need Jesus, whether you realize that or not. But I'm praying that God could do what I couldn't do if we're ready to hear from him. I know some of you came here excited. You're ready to worship. You're full of joy. You're excitement. Others of you, maybe you're carrying some burdens in here. And even though you're dressed up and looking good for Easter, you don't feel as good as you look. And you all look pretty good. And some of you came here because it's just what you do. Mom made you put the shirt on, and Grandma said, I just want you to go to church, and so you don't really believe this, but you're here. Whatever the case, I really do believe the risen Jesus has something to say to us if we're willing to listen, if we're paying attention. Several weeks ago, we had a guest um, speaker. Uh, well, you know, just a moment ago, we sang a song called uh, Living Hope. I don't know if you caught those phrases. He is our living hope. And that comes right out of the New Testament uh, letter of First Peter. Here it is on the screen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. God gave us new life through the resurrection of Jesus. How do you, how do you contain that in a single sermon? And I mentioned a few weeks ago, we had a guest speaker here, Rachel Gilson. Uh, she talked talk to us about her story. Didn't grow up as a Christian, grew up as an atheist, had no interest in God, thought Christians were kind of simple-minded and weak, was at Yale studying, and God got a hold of her life and radically changed her. She told about this resurrection power, this living hope, how it came into her life. And she said something in her message that just struck me. It's a simple phrase, but I wrote it down. I've been thinking about it, and I'm just, here it is. She said, I'm betting my life on the resurrection. I'm betting my life on the resurrection, where she was betting it on her intellect, on her ability to, uh, to achieve, to accomplish, her relationships. She said she came to realize that there's only one worth betting your life on, and it's the Lord Jesus, the risen king. Because the truth is, we're all betting our life on something. You are. You may not think of it that way, but you're, you're putting your chips in somewhere, right? My career, my family, this marriage, my kids' success, the U.S. economy, maybe not a bit, good bet. Like, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm putting it on something. I'm, I'm basing my significance, my hope, on someone or something. Well, who, who or what is worth that? Worth the bet that you can trust. It's a sure thing. I think most people, my, my own life and my experience as a pastor, most of us, if we're honest, we, we base our beliefs not on what is, we, we really research to be true. We just base our beliefs on what we would prefer to be true what we desire, what we want. But who do you trust to tell you the truth? In that great theological movie, A Few Good Men, have you seen that movie? When Tom Cruise, the lawyer, like he never ages, but that's, no, no, no. He, he says uh, to Jack Nicholson, I want the truth. And what does Jack Nicholson say? 
You can't handle the truth, which I love that line. <laughs> Who do you trust to tell you the truth and do you really want to hear it? Well, if in fact he is risen, it's not just words we sing. Maybe we can trust the risen king to tell us the truth. He did say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Author and evangelist Lee Strobel, who's also an atheist, uh, you might know him from the Case for Christ movie or the book by the same title that he wrote. He, his wife became a Christian through a Bible study that her friends invited her to, and he was annoyed by this, and he was a, a Chicago Sun-Times journalist, investigative journalist, and he used his journalistic powers to try to disprove this thing his wife was into, and that's what led him to faith in Jesus, the risen king. And he said this about, uh, about when he was an atheist. He said, even as an atheist, I understood one thing about Christianity. It rises or falls on the resurrection of Jesus. Even when I didn't believe, I sort of got this is the whole ballgame. It all depends on this. I understood that. I think it's uh, easy to get caught up in the peripheral things. Questions on the, like secondary issues. I remember talking to a guy who was a skeptic. He, he, he was coming to church and he believed generally in God, but he wasn't sure about the whole Jesus thing. And he said, there's just too much in this book that I can't accept. He said, like, for example, Jonah and the whale. I mean, come on. I just can't believe the Bible because of that story. I said, fair enough. That's a good question. We can talk about that. But let's start with the empty tomb. Before Jonah and the whale, let's start with Jesus and the empty tomb. Because if God can raise him from the dead, then he can store a guy in a fish if he wants to. Whatever you think about that, his po the point is, this is the question you answer first. As uh, Yaroslav Pelikan, who's an American-born but Romanian uh, scholar. Doesn't he look like a fun grandpa, too? Anyway. <laughs> Brilliant uh, theologian, he writes, if Christ is risen, nothing else matters. And if Christ is not risen, nothing else matters. He doesn't mean there's never any other questions, nothing else is worth talking about. What he means is, this is the central question which sheds light on all the others. This comes first. And it's worth answering. Again and again, and maybe for the first time for some of you. Paul, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 puts it this way, about as starkly as you can. He says, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, including what I'm doing right now. And your faith is in vain. If the resurrection is a fairy tale, a good moral lesson about good triumphing over evil, then what are we doing here? Go eat eggs. Go have brunch. This is not worth the time. Because everything rests on the reality and power of the resurrection. And I think it's easy to become so familiar with the story that we miss that. We miss what's really happening, what has happened. Jesus puts it this way to Mary and Martha, right before he raises their brother Lazarus from the grave as a little glimpse of what's to come in his own resurrection, he says this to them. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? It's a question worth asking yourself. I won't presume that just because you showed up here, you believe it. Really believe it, enough to bet your life on it. Do you believe this? Jesus asks, and I think he still asks. Last couple of weeks, if you were a part of Chapel Street Church, John Dixon, a brilliant New Testament historian and professor and scholar and part of our preaching team, led us through the road to resurrection, and he gave two weeks on the, the historical and biblical evidence for the resurrection. And if you're a person who needs evidence, if you're a person who wrestles with, can I really trust this, I would urge you go back and watch and listen to those two sermons. They're outstanding. He walks us through how can we know, how can we trust that this isn't a fairy tale? And it really happened, and how should we respond? And he finished that last week's sermon by taking us through the story in John 20 of Doubting Thomas. Rather unfortunate nickname to have for all the rest of, of history, Doubting Thomas, but there it is. He really becomes Believing Thomas. And in John 20, we get, I want to walk us through three transformations the resurrection brings about. Two individuals and one group of people that meet the risen Jesus, and everything changes for them. The first one I just mentioned, the resurrection can turn doubt into faith. This is the story of Thomas. You know what he famously said, I won't believe unless I what? See and touch. And he's a modern skeptic. I need that physical evidence. And Jesus meets him at the place of his doubt. Here's the story in verses 25 through 28. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, it's getting kind of gruesome, I will never believe. 
His best friends are saying, we've seen him. And he's like, yeah, I don't believe you. I have to see for myself. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Again, you can go back and listen to this sermon, but Thomas goes from I will never believe to my Lord and my God because of an encounter with the risen Jesus. The resurrection can turn even the hardest skeptic into a person of faith. Second, transformation. The resurrection can transform fear into courage. The fearful and the timid into the bold, the courageous. Just before this story with Thomas, Jesus appears to the rest of the disciples at one time. Here's how that story goes, verses 19 through 22. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors were being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. These men are hiding in a locked room because they're afraid. This is hardly a description of those who will turn the Roman world upside down in the years to come because of their courageous, bold testimony. They're scared. And he goes on. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad. That sounds like an understatement. They were glad when they saw the Lord Jesus. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. We'll come back to that last line. That sounds a little strange in a minute. But you see what's happening? These men, terrified. Why are they afraid? They've watched the, the one they've given their, they bet their life on Jesus. They watched him die at the hands of the Jews. Now, the, the Pontius Pilate put him to death, the Roman official, but the Jewish leadership basically strong-armed or pressured Pilate into having him crucified. And they saw it all happen. They ran away in fear when it happened, and they're hiding in fear now until they meet the risen Jesus. And he says, as his father sent me, so I'm sending you. And these men would go into all the world and would proclaim over and over again the risen Jesus even at risk of their life, and all but one of them died a terrible death for their proclamation, for their witness. In my, one of my favorite stories, the book of Acts, Peter and John, or we'll see them a little bit later in John here in a minute, are uh, preaching about Jesus after the resurrection. And the Jewish authorities, the same ones who had Jesus put to death, arrest them, beat them, bring them before the Sanhedrin, the high council, and tell them, you better shut up about Jesus. And they say, well, you judge for yourselves if it's right to obey you or men. We can't help but talk about what we have seen. And they, they, they won't stop, in other words. And then in Acts 4.13, this is the verse. It says, when they, the Jewish leaders, saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note they had been with Jesus. In other words, these are nobody. These guys aren't highly educated. They're not from important families. They don't hold positions of power in the culture. And we can't get them to stop. We killed their leader, and they won't be quiet about him. Where does their courage come from? Only one explanation. They'd been with Jesus. They'd seen him, the risen Jesus. And it changed them from hiding in a locked room to going into all the world. Now, before we get to the, the third transformation, where I want to spend a little more time, I want to go back to the beginning of John's account Speaking of courage, I remember years ago, I went, I went to Russia uh, in two, the year 2000 to help a church that we had supported celebrate its, its centennial, 100 years. It outlasted communism. Incredible people. I met some amazing saints, brothers and sisters in the Lord who just full of faith. One, one guy was named Brother Victor. He was an elder in that church. He, was, he looked like a Russian hobbit. He's about this tall. He had huge, bushy eyebrows, like crazy, like, I mean, like two gray caterpillars sticking out of his head. And, uh, and he, lived, he had seen so much. He talked story after story about how he'd suffered for his faith, how he'd uh, lost jobs, how his children had been denied entrance into university because they were Christians, how he'd been arrested for, for teaching the Bible, how he'd been beaten at times, uh, spent six years away from his family in a, in, a, in a work camp. And he told this all with like a light in his eyes and with a smile and with joy, these horrible stories. It's just, he had incredible joy and courage because he'd met the risen Jesus. He'd met Jesus. He was just full of faith. And by the way, just as a little side note, Russian men in the church kiss each other on the lips as a greeting. I didn't know this at the time. And he reached up to grab me by my neck to pull me down to greet me. And it was like crazy strong for like a little old Russian hobbit. And he pulled me down like this. I'm like, ah! And he, I, I turned my, he got me like right there. So just in case you go there someday, you, you know now. 
Anyway, let's go back to John chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark. Anybody get up to see the sunrise this morning? Nobody? You should do it tomorrow. He's still risen tomorrow. You can watch the sunrise tomorrow. And saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. By the way, John's writing this. That's the way John describes himself, like a little humble brag there. I'm the one he loved. And said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So he doesn't want to give you his name, but he's like, I'm faster than Peter. I'm the one he loved, and I'm faster than that guy. Like, I just think that's funny. They reached the tomb first. Now, all four gospel accounts tell us that Mary Magdalene was the first to see the empty tomb and to meet the risen Jesus. We'll come back to her in a minute. She sees the tomb empty. She doesn't go in. She runs to Peter and John to tell them what has happened. And what is her explanation for the empty tomb? They have taken the Lord away. What does she not say? What never enters her mind? What does she not assume? Resurrection. Somebody stole him. Like, now, a little bit about Mary Magdalene here. She's from the village of Magdala, a little fishing village in the Sea of Galilee, not far from Nazareth, a nowhere village in a nothing part of Israel. We don't know much about her early life, we don't, but she shows up all over the resurrection accounts. She was a part of this entourage of women that had been changed by the mercy of Jesus and were like female disciples following him around. In Luke 8, verse 2, we are told that Jesus healed her of seven demons. Now, whatever you think about that, the point is this is a woman who had suffered severe emotional, spiritual, and mental trauma. Deep oppression and pain and darkness. And a social outcast. And Jesus changed her. Healed her. Set her free. Liberated her. And she says, I'm betting my life on this guy. She follows him everywhere. And then she watches him die. Arrested, beaten, tortured, suffer, and die. It's like her whole world has just crumbled. All she's got left is I could at least honor his remains. I just want to care for his body. Some last expression of gratitude for who this man was. And she goes to the tomb and he's not even there. Like there's no focal point for her grief. She can't even find a body to care for. She's a shattered person. But it never enters her mind that he's risen. Why? Well, because in her experience, like probably yours and mine, dead people stay dead. It doesn't, they don't, it doesn't occur to her. Even though Jesus said repeatedly throughout the Gospels, on the third day, the Son of Man will rise. He must be betrayed, must suffer at the hands of sinful men, but I will rise. Nobody saw it coming. No one looked for him. She's only there to care for the body. The distance, by the way, they were, run, they were traveling to get there from the upper room where the door was locked to the empty tomb is about three quarters of a mile to a mile. And John is faster than Peter. Look at five through 10. And stooping to look in, he, that's John, saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb. This is so Peter. If you know anything about the New Testament, Peter's not a guy who, like, stops to think about his actions. John pauses to look inside. Peter just barges right in, even though he was second one there. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first... <laughs> also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand what the, scripture, the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Let's go back one slide. Something interesting happening here that you don't always get in English that John is saying to us. There's three different Greek words used for the word saw, which shows there's a lot of looking and seeing going on here, and I want to walk you through that. First, and stooping to look in, John, it says he saw he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. This is a Greek word that simply means to stare, to look intently, like you would do if you got there, looking into an empty tomb. I would imagine I'd be like John. I might stop first and go, whoa, what's in there? He's looking to see. And then Peter barges in, and he saw linen cloths lying there. This is a different word. This is the Greek word theoreo. It, it, we get a word to like to... to um, the, uh, English word theory, or theorize from. So he's uh, perceive, contemplate, experience. So John is staring in what's going on. Peter goes in and is staring at this, going, trying to make sense of it, trying to understand, 
trying to come up with an explanation for what it is that he sees. And then John goes in, the next slide. The other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw. This again is a, set, a third word. This is the word Ido, and it means to understand. Because right after this, he saw and believed, which is the Greek word pistis, where we get our word faith. This is, so the point is this, there's a progression happening here. Looking intently, staring, trying to understand, coming to believe. Well, what did John believe? Well, he believed that the tomb was empty. And he believed that something had happened that, that, that a grave robbery can't explain. Part of the reason the detail about the cloths is included is that um, the, way, the way tombs worked in the first century, and I've been in some of these ancient tombs in Israel, is there, uh, there would be a carved out uh, opening and a stone slab where you'd lay the deceased's body. There were niches around the, the, the tomb where it had little boxes, ossuaries, bone boxes. For the other people that had died and decomposed, you put them in boxes. I know it sounds gross, but that's what they did. So the family would all be in turn entombed together. But the most recently deceased person lays on that slab. It's wrapped tightly like a mummy on their lower body. They're from their neck down, uh, and the body's anointed and treated, and the head is wrapped separately. That's how they did it. So Peter goes in, and he sees the body wrap is like just laying there all wadded up, kind of like when you get up in the morning in a hurry, and you don't make your bed, just, lay, just all just laying there. But the face cloth is folded neatly and, and set aside, which, by the way, moms and dads, is not a reason for you to go home and tell your kids, see, even Jesus folded his clothes. That's not what the point is. <laughs> the point is this. They're looking at this going, what's happening here? The point is, grave robbers don't typically unwrap the body, and they certainly don't fold up the head covering and set it neatly. Something strange has happened. Something inexplicable has happened. And John comes to believe that Jesus is alive. But he does not yet understand what it means. He hasn't connected the dots that, to the scriptures. This is all part of God's plan. That this is the victory. This is the, the kingdom Jesus talked about. He doesn't get it yet. Because what do they do? They go back to their homes. I always find this strange. The empty tomb. What does it mean? Huh, let's go home. You know, they just go back. But Mary doesn't. Mary stays there. And this brings us to the final transformation I want to talk to you about. The resurrection can transform sorrow into joy. Peter and John are in there seeing, staring, looking, trying to explain. Mary's on the outside of the tomb weeping. This is the story of what happens to her. Verses 11 through 14. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. Pause there for a minute. Did Peter and John miss the angels? Did they just not see him? I doubt it. I think Mary's getting a special revelation because God has something special for her as the first witness to the risen Jesus. Two angels in there, one at the head, one at the feet of the, of the slab where Jesus' body had lain, which if you're a Bible nerd, that should conjure up images in your mind of the mercy seat, the place of sacrifice, two angels hovering over the mercy seat. Jesus, who is the sacrifice, laying there and the, place is, the sacrifice has been made, there are the angels at either end. And they say to her, woman, why are you weeping? That always strikes me as something of a root. Like, can you imagine going to a, a graveside and seeing some lady standing by a, a grave and she's crying? And would you walk up to her and go, what are you crying about? Like, that'd be such a rude question, right? But they're asking for a different reason. Why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. Having said that, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she didn't know that it was Jesus. Maybe the tears in her eyes, maybe the morning light, but probably she's not looking for a risen Savior. She's looking for a corpse. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? I want to just pause. and I think these two questions are crucial for us to wrestle with. Why are you weeping? And whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Think about that for a minute. This grieving woman is going to go find a grown man's corpse. I don't know what Jesus weighed, 160, 170, less than me probably. She's going to find this 150-pound man, dead, dead weight, literally, throw it over her shoulder and like, what? Where's she going to go? 
Can you imagine like her walking around Jerusalem with like a corpse over her shoulder? I don't think she's thought this through is the point. She's in terrible grief. She just wants to be near anything she can that would remind her of who he is. And he's standing right next to her talking to her, but she doesn't see it. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. We'll pause, we'll go back, we'll stay there for a minute. Now, in the midst of her grief, Mary still looks into the tomb. And maybe even though we're all dressed up and looking good, maybe you came in here carrying your own weight of grief, your own fear. I just want to urge you, be like Mary. In the midst of your tears, your grief, your doubt, your fears, look into the tomb. That's the place to look. That's the place to bring your tears and your grief and your sorrow. And she does this. The angel asks her, why are you weeping? Why is she weeping? We've talked about that. But why are you weeping if you are? Why are you holding back the tears? What are they about? I talked to a man at the beginning of last, our 7 a.m. service, and we were talking about all the sadness in the world. Just all the reasons. To, it doesn't, you don't have to look very far, do you? School shootings. Abuse of children. Horrible oppression and violence. Human trafficking. I mean, every day. There's just a barrage of awful things that we try to sort of anesthetize ourselves to it and turn away. And the tears are not just out there. They're here as well. I mean, I, I, you've got them. I have tears of regret about my own failure, my own sin, my own inability to live up to who I, the man I'm supposed to be. Over loss. That which I had bet my life on crumbled beneath me. A failed marriage, loss of a job, we all have reasons to weep, even though we try to ignore that. That's what the question's about. Why are you weeping? And the resurrection doesn't say, oh, Christians, just pretend that everything's okay. It doesn't ignore our tears. But it says to us, your tears are not the final word. They're not the end of the story. They're real, and God meets you in them, but they're not the end. And then whom are you seeking? Well, who is she seeking? Jesus, but not the risen Jesus. Think about Mary for a minute. She's surrounded by an empty tomb, two angels, and Jesus himself, and she doesn't see. I think it's possible to come to church your whole life, go through the religious motions, go to Sunday school, do all the stuff, and not see, not really see who he is, not be changed by him. When does it happen for Mary? When does it change for her. You can see it right there in the story, right? Jesus said to her, Mary. Mary. I, I, uh, I think his voice saying her name probably brought her back to the time she first heard him speak it when she was a mess. Mary. And it undoes her. Now, in the resurrection, there's a lot happening I want to point out to you, but it's deeply personal. The story John is telling, there's a layer here that, that, it's, that I think we, we can skip right over. Do you notice that it, every time Jesus shows up, he says, peace be with you? Did you catch that? Three times, the disciples, peace be with you. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. Jesus would have spoken Hebrew or Aramaic. Shalom, wholeness, uh, harmony with God, with the world, and with each other. Shalom, peace, harmony I bring to you. And three times we're told that it happens on the first day of the week. In the Jewish week, what's the first day? Sunday. We think about Monday as the first day of the week, not for the Jews, it was Sunday. The first day of the week, that's significant. John is echoing the Genesis account of creation. We just finished a series called The Gospel in Genesis. Here's what he's saying on the first day of the week. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. On the first day of the week, new creation begins at the resurrection. Christians believe that Jesus will return and restore all things, new heavens and new earth, all things made right and whole again. And that doesn't begin someday far away in the future. It begins at the empty tomb. That's what John is telling us. Think about it for a minute. On the sixth day of creation, God finished creating. The work of creation was finished. On the sixth day of the week, Good Friday, Jesus from the cross said, Tetelestai, it is finished. Creation is finished on the sixth day. Salvation was finished on the sixth day. On the seventh day of creation, what does God do? Rests. What does Jesus do on the seventh day in the tomb? 
rests. And early on the morning of the first day, just as the sun was beginning to peak over the hills, he rose. And his resurrection inaugurates new creation, new life. Remember when it said that John says that Jesus breathed on them? What is that about? Like, what does his breath smell like? Do you ever wonder these, these things like I do? It's an echo back to Genesis 2, 7. When God made man from the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. He breathed on them new life, new creation, new possibilities. He's here now because I've conquered the grave. The last enemy to be defeated is death. This is what John is telling us. So the resurrection is cosmic in its scope, but it's deeply personal. Because Mary doesn't understand any of this until Jesus calls her name. And really, that's the point for you. Have you heard him call your name? Your name. Have you heard in your soul the risen Jesus call your name? Tom, Lisa, Jeff, Paige. Has he said your name? And if he has, have you responded enough to bet your life on it? I think he's still speaking our names today, if we're listening. This is what happens to Mary. And the story goes on. There's this part at the end. He said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers. I love that. If I have to be honest, if I was the one who had been betrayed and denied and deserted, I might be tempted to say, go tell those, those suckers I'm coming for them. <laughs> go tell my brothers. I'm going to speak their names too. I, I've risen for them too. He said, I have not yet ascended. I'm going to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. This is access. This is invitation. Jesus says, you have a relationship with the father through me now. I go to make sure that that happens. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Why does he say don't cling to me? It seems strange, right? Is it because he's super holy and she might get like burned if she touches him? No. It's because she's, it's, here's what's happening. She's like, I lost you once. I cannot lose you again. And Jesus is saying, you'll never lose me. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. You cannot lose me. But I'm not done yet. I'm going to the Father, and you're going to tell the world. We have work to do, Mary. I have something for you. Think about that. Who's the first person that God chooses to see the empty tomb, meet the risen Jesus, and tell the world about it? This social outcast, this woman from a, a, a nowhere village, that's who he chooses. You go tell. We are here this morning because of the power of the empty tomb and the message of a woman named Mary and many, many others since. Jesus speaks your name, not so you can have your own private little relationship with him you keep to yourself, but so you can be set free and tell others what's available to them. I have seen the Lord. Jesus said to Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? It's worth betting your life on. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pause and acknowledge that we often base our life on all the wrong things. We say we believe in you, but functionally we live as if we're betting on, on ourselves or on someone else. Thank you for the reminder this morning that your resurrection changes everything and there is only one who can bear the weight of our whole life and that's you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you that you, you, you rose from the grave to restore all things, including us. And I pray by your spirit, we would hear you speak our name in a new and powerful way. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus, our risen and reigning King. Amen. We leave you again with Peter's words to the church, to us, to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Friends, he is worth betting your life on. One more time, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter.